Can you hear me? Hello, welcome. I'm John Hunt, I'm um, chair of the UM English department. Uh, Jeff Badenock asked me to join him in doing some short readings from literary texts before these lectures, so we're alternating during the six weeks. Um, I have three short things I'd like to read you, um, sort of loosely grouped under a title, Come Down to the Water, which is a phrase from um, the first one that I'll read, um, and they're all about that, coming down to the water in a, not only a physical sense, but a metaphysical sense. People gathering at the water, people feeling the pull of water and what it means to them. So I won't talk too much, but maybe just a little bit between the passages. Um, the first one is from Annie Dillard's Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, um, which is a, a book that she wrote sort of like Thoreau's Walden of natural observation looking at this creek that she lived next to in the um, Blue Hills um, in Virginia. And um, she, she, everywhere she looks, including in the water, she sees the violence of life, the competition for survival. Um, the, the natural universe is a blood-soaked place for her. So this passage that I'm reading, which is from our neck of the woods, from the Rocky Mountains, combines the image of fire with all its violence with the coolness and tranquility of water. At the time of Lewis and Clark, setting the prairies on fire was a well-known signal that meant come down to the water. It was an extravagant gesture, but we can't do less. If the landscape reveals one certainty, it is that the extravagant gesture is the very stuff of creation. After the one extravagant gesture of creation in the first place, the universe has continued to deal exclusively in extravagances, flinging intricacies and colossi down eons of emptiness, heaping profusions on profligacies with ever fresh vigor. The whole show has been on fire from the word go. I come down to the water to cool my eyes, but everywhere I look, I see fire. That which isn't flint is tinder, and the whole world sparks and flames. My second piece is calmer and more hopeful <laughs> than her vision generally, which is, um, for her, nature is a a place to contemplate theology, and her God is an Old Testament, <laughs> angry, violent um, person. I would describe this poem by Wendell Berry as a much more New Testament kind of vision of nature, um, though there's an echo, I think, of one of the Psalms, um, that line, he maketh me to lie down beside the still waters. So this is by Wendell Berry, who's a Kentucky farmer, poet, novelist, social activist, ecologist, and it's called The Peace of Wild Things. When despair for the world grows in me, and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water. And I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. And finally, I've got a couple of paragraphs from Herman Melville's Moby Dick um, from the beginning of the book when Ishmael is feeling the pull of the sea again. Um, he, he always knows when um, he has the impulse to knock strangers' hats off in the street that it's time to go to sea <laughs> again. Um, and he's talking about the pull that the ocean has for people, but he also talks about water in general. Um, and in this beginning of the book, he is um, 
contemplating a, a scene in Manhattan, it could be any city on the water, but it starts in Manhattan, with people who just find themselves at the water's edge and standing there looking into the water. But look, here come more crowds pacing straight for the water and seemingly bound for a dive. Strange. Nothing will content them but the extremest limit of the land. Loitering under the shady lee of yonder warehouses will not suffice. No, they must get just as nigh the water as they possibly can without falling in. And there they stand, miles of them, leagues. Inlanders all, they come from lakes and alleys, stream, streets and avenues, north, east, south, and west. Yet here they all unite. Tell me, does the magnetic virtue of the needles of the compasses of all those ships attract them hither? Once more, say you are in the country in some high land of lakes. Take almost any path you please and tend to one it carries you down in a dale and leaves you there by a pool in the stream. There is magic in it. Let the most absent-minded of men be plunged in his deepest reveries. Stand that man on his legs, set his feet a-going, and he will infallibly lead you to water if water there be in all that region. Should you ever be athirst in the great American desert, try this experiment, if your caravan happened to be supplied with a metaphysical professor. Yes, as everyone knows, meditation and water are wedded forever. Thanks very much, John. Um, John and Jeff Badnock, I believe, are going to trade off doing readings before each one of these lectures because we all felt as though we wanted to get some of the rich literature about water um, into this lecture as well. So thank you all for being here. I'm here to do my usual thing. First, please turn off your cell phone. You probably just heard my, me turning mine off. You can't even turn mine off silently. It just goes, da 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 I don't know why. But please turn off your cell phones if you haven't done that yet. I welcome you to this, uh, this iteration of our uh, lecture series. I'm very excited about our lecturer tonight. And I want to introduce her in just a moment. But first, I want to remind you of a couple of things. That is that MCAT is taping the series. And we'll be able to let you know by the end of the series. And it will also be published on the alumni website, um, the schedule for broadcast of these, uh, of these series. As I've said before, sometimes on a Saturday night, because I don't have too much of a life, I'm just flicking my remote. And I run into some colleague, and there he is. He's just giving a lecture. She's giving a lecture. It's really qu quite great. So I think they usually come up on Saturday night. So um, you'll be able to watch them again if you should happen to miss one of these. Uh, the other thing is that the slideshow is uh, given to us by the Montana Museum of Art and Culture here on campus. And also there's some art having to do with waters over at the library and also in the president's office until uh, March 25th, I believe. So uh, do drop in there and, um, and give it a look. And we thank the people at the Montana for that. I don't know whether Barb is here or Brian here, either one of them. In any case, so um, we thank them for their, for their contribution to this series. Um, as I said to you, I ask each one of the lecturers to let me know how he or she became interested in waters, um, because it sort of intrigues me to find out how all of these people have been drawn to, this, to a particular topic. And um, Rosalind was kind enough to respond, and she lets me know that she's from Montana, both sides of her family. She says that her father's family arrived in the 1850s, and her mother's family has been here since, I guess, the land bridge across the Bering Straits. She says that's really a joke, but I don't know how much of a joke. <laughs> but in any case, that gives you an idea that they've been around for a long time. I grew up next to Willow Creek, she says, on the Blackfeet Reservation in my grandparents' house. I grew up hearing rich stories of supernatural beings who live in and underwater, in the lakes and rivers of north central Montana. Respect, prayer, and offerings were always given to the Sui Tabi, the underwater people who lived in the rivers and lakes. They were viewed as just as real as humans. And then she says, I'm not sure if I developed an interest or if the respect or fear was just always there. 
<clears throat> but it sounds as though this is a this is an old time subject for Rosalind. I'm really excited to hear Rosalind lecture tonight. Again, she's one of those people whom I see on campus a lot, but we never run into each other in this kind of in this kind of situation or this kind of venue. Um, and I was reading actually a little bit about Rosalind, and it strikes me that she's really the Renaissance woman. Um, she was trained in physics as an undergraduate, I believe, and then liberal studies uh, as well. So she's had a science training and a humanities training. And uh, the one time I've, I've, seen, um, I've seen Rosalind perform, do her thing, was when we had a couple of years ago in the CAS uh, an evening of discussion between a humanities professor and a, a science professor, and Rosalind was the, uh, was the moderator. So I can see why she was chosen now. In any case, I'm really looking forward to Rosalind's talk. Um, so we tapi the place of water in the Blackfeet universe. Rosalind LaPierre. So. Good evening, my name's Rosalind. And hopefully we have everything going here. Oh, hey. Okay. <laughs> All this modern technology, I'm not used to it. So uh, tonight I'm going to give a talk about the place of water um, in the Blackfeet universe. And um, I'm gonna cover a lot of different things kind of leading up to that point. Um, including talking a little bit about my family and talking a, l a little bit about religion. Um, it was mentioned earlier, uh, my master's degree I studied at DePaul University with a lot of different Jesuit priests um, in the religious studies department there. And I was very interested in um, Catholicism at the time uh, because part of my family is Catholic and uh, was interested in sort of my Blackfeet side of the family and that uh, belief uh, system and then also kind of the Western system. And so I was, had a great time at DePaul University kind of trying to fuse those two together. So I'll talk a little bit about that as well this evening. So first up, let me see if these, this is a picture of my grandmother and her grandmother. My grandmother was raised uh, by her grandmother because uh, she, her, her mother had uh, died in childbirth about two years after she was born. So then she was given to a grandmother and a great-grandmother. So she was raised by two women. And so most of her knowledge and her information came from these two women. And um, it's kind of an interesting story because her mother was very um, sort of this modern woman and she um, tried her best to sort of live in uh, contemporary modern times and then she passed away and then her daughter was given to these two very old women who um, did not speak English, um, did not participate in any way in sort of contemporary society and, and were very old fashioned in a lot of their ways. And so my grandmother grew up learning from those two women a lot of different um, information. And then on my grandfather's side of the family um, he also was adopted as a child, and he was raised by an older couple. And so this is a picture of his father and his mother. Um, his mother was actually one of his um, aunties, and so they adopted him because they could not have children of their own and did not have children of their own. And so uh, they actually adopted two boys an older boy and then uh, my grandfather. And so he was in the same situation where he ended up being raised by older people, again, uh, who did not speak the English language, um, didn't really participate very much in kind of Western society or anything like that. And so uh, back in those days, uh, the Blackfeet still participated in uh, arranged marriages because in the old days, they, people didn't marry for uh, love. They married, uh, almost everybody had an arranged marriage. So these two older women got together and they arranged the marriage of my grandparents. And so part of Blackfeet culture or part of Blackfeet society is that the women always got to, get to decide or choose. So even though it was an arranged marriage, it was up to my grandmother to basically say yes or no whether she was going to participate in this marriage. 
And so at the time, she didn't want to get married. She wanted to work. So, so she worked for a few years, and she worked at a boarding school on the Blackfeet Reservation. And uh, she worked there uh, just doing all kinds of odd jobs. And then finally, you know, kind of as the story goes, she was in town, and my grandfather kind of tracked her down and said, you know, you need to kind of decide, because he couldn't do anything, right? I mean, he couldn't be, have another arranged marriage until she said yes or no. And so she was like, well, I guess, well, OK. So, <laughs> but it was like sort of a two-year, not even a courtship, exactly. But anyway, so they eventually got married, and they had um, 12 children. Um, and so my mother's kind of somewhere in the middle. Uh, so again, they, as I said, they were both raised by older people. They were both raised in, uh, in families where English, they did not speak English. Uh, when my mother was growing up, um, English was the second language in their home. And um, when I was growing up with them, English was the second language in the home. Um, although, uh, they raised me just to speak English. So there was a real effort at that point that um, people only spoke English, or their younger people only spoke English. So um, even though I was being raised in a, in a family where they spoke a lot of Blackfeet, and that's the way they communicated with each other, um, there was an expectation that I completely learn English. And one of the ways I learned English was um, uh, my family, this is way back in the day, they used to buy those little 45 records of, um, of uh, Walt Disney stories. <laughs> And so I had these 45 records, and I had the books. And so I, I was kind of the uh, self-taught reading and listening to stories. Uh, anyway, so one of the things I wanted to mention about this is that, you know, how does information get passed on? And how do we know what we know about the Blackfeet? And one of the ways we know that is through family stories. And so a lot of what I'm going to be talking about tonight is mostly family stories. Um, and then there's also sort of the book knowledge, right? So about the time when my grandparents uh, were born and were being raised, there was a big effort on the Blackfeet Reservation for people to come from the outside and record them and to take down their stories. So one of the people that came was this guy named Cornelius um, Uhlenbeck. And he was uh, from Europe. And he came over with different graduate students uh, through two different summers and recorded a lot of different stories. And his work is some of the most, I think, kind of the most rich work out there in terms of Blackfeet stories uh, that exist. And what he did was he recorded them in Blackfeet. And so if you read them, he'll, he has them printed in Blackfeet, and then he has them um, translated into English. He's not the only one who came. There were a lot of different people who came to the Blackfeet Reservation then and recorded a lot of stories um, from uh, the elders at that time. One of the things they tried to do at that time was only record people that they considered quote unquote Buffalo Indians. And what that meant was they tried to only record people who had been born and raised before the bison had, had um, died. And so they ended up recording people like my grandfather's parents because they had been born in the 1850s um, so they had, and 1860s. So they were in their 20s and 30s by the time the buffalo had um, disappeared. And so those are the types of people they went out and recorded. So when they were recording people, they tried not to record what they considered, quote unquote, reservation Indians, which was people who were born and raised and lived their entire life on the reservation. So there was a really strategic effort during that time period to only record certain people. And, um, and so anyway, so they recorded uh, uh, people that were from my grandmother and grandfather's community. So they went specifically there to record them. And a lot, of, like I said, there's a lot of other scholars who came during that time period to record sort of these stories. And um, so as part of what, again, what I'm sharing tonight is sort of family stories and then also stories that have been recorded as well. So you'll get a little bit of both. So very quickly, for those of you who don't know, who are the Blackfeet, right? <laughs> so are most people here from Montana? OK. <laughs> Mixed, OK. So the Blackfeet are a tribe. 
a group of several tribes, and I'll mention that in a minute. Um, so the Blackfeet live and have lived for a very long time in the northern part of the northern Great Plains. And so let's see if I can do this. Wait, which was, oh, here we go. Okay, so the Blackfeet live, or used to live, um, north of the Yellowstone, so there's the Yellowstone, right, all the way up to the Saskatchewan. So the Blackfeet originally lived in this whole territory here of what is now Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Montana, and basically sort of this half of the northern half of the northern Great Plains. And it's kind of interesting because there's kind of no, there, there, there's a reason why that is, and part of it is ecological. <clears throat> so really briefly, uh, the archaeologists for the most part, although they argue, there's probably an archaeologist in the crowd right now. Uh, <laughs> they, they say that there's been human existence, right, on the northern Great Plains maybe for the last 20,000 years. Some people will say 12,000, 14,000, 25,000. There's some people who say 40,000. But sort of in the mid-range is where most people sort of claim that there's been human existence, hu human, uh, you know, habitation on the northern Great Plains. What archaeologists also claim is that the people that are now the Blackfeet, they can trace them uh, kind of a direct lineage back to about 2,000 years. After 2,000 years, it gets a little iffy as to who exactly, it, who, who is who, right? They know there have been people there. They can trace that there have been people there, but are they the same people that have been there? So in terms of sameness, um, most scholars, most um, archaeologists would argue that it's been the same people for the last 2,000 years that have been living in this particular area. And since... Uh, about the early 1800s, um, for the most part, uh, we can say that there have been five different groups. This last group here, that's on the bottom, uh, was in a war in 1846 with another tribe, not with the United States government, with another tribe. And for the most part, was um, most of them um, were killed during that war. And the ones that were not then um, moved in with the other groups. So historically, since about 1850, there have been these other four groups that continue to exist to today. So um, the other four groups that now constitute what people consider kind of the Blackfoot Confederacy, um, one is uh, the Blackfeet that live here in the United States, and then the three other groups are in Canada, and they all have reserves in Canada. So there are four separate sort of reserves or reservations that these four groups now currently live on. The majority of the research, as I mentioned earlier, that's ever been done on any of these groups, almost all of it's been done in the state of Montana, and almost all of it's been done with um, the Amskapi Pukuni, or the Southern Pagan, that are now considered the Blackfeet. So almost all the research, at any scholar that is going to do studies on this, if they want to do a study on one of the tribes in Canada, they almost always have to use the research that's been done in Montana, because that's where everybody came and did research. So again, if you uh, remember the map from a moment ago, the Northern Great Plains is kind of a really unique uh, place. It is a very arid and semi-arid place. There's uh, hardly any trees. It's, uh, well, you can kind of tell from the photo. Uh, it, it's what you consider sort of the rolling plains or the Great Plains um, of North America. Since the Blackfeet have lived in that place for so long, they've developed sort of a unique culture based on that particular place. And part of what I'll um, continue to talk about this evening is sort of they developed a sort of unique relationship with water because of the relationship to place. And part of what they had to do because they were in such an arid uh, place in North America is one, they always had to live near water. It was extremely rare when they were not near water. Um, I think in some ways there was kind of a stereotype that uh, native people on the plains living on teepees or out you know, on the prairie, um, that was rarely the case. They were never out on the prairie. They were always near a river 
always near a large creek, um, usually almost always in a sheltered area. Uh, so they, you know, there would be a high bluff. They would be at the bottom of the bluff next to the river. Um, so it was extremely rare when they were ever actually out on the prairies or on the, you know, um, uh, out in the uh, plains areas. Uh, the other thing that they did, and this is something that archaeologists in Canada mostly have been researching, is uh, they believe, archaeologists believe, that one of the things that they did was they, tried, they altered their landscape a lot. And so they either altered their landscape with fire or in other ways. And one of the things that um, a group of archaeologists at the University of Calgary is figuring out is that along these large rivers and tributaries that the Blackfeet created what they called parklands. Um, so, and they figured out that to a certain extent that the parklands existed almost exactly a day's walk to the next place. So they would create a space where there was a lot of um, uh, cottonwood trees, a lot of berry bushes, um, a lot of the plants that they needed uh, for their daily existence, and then basically there would be nothing for until the next day, and then there'd be another parkland. And so this is something that, again, archaeologists are trying to figure out how people kind of lived in these areas. And, it's, and what they're realizing is that um, the Blackfeet over generations had created a lot of these spaces um, so that when they did move about, because they were nomadic, uh, that they went to a place that already had all the resources that they needed would be there. Um, and the other way that they altered space was um, they would uh, create places where animals would frequent, either through burning or other methods. So again, they wouldn't have to like, I mean, sort of the stereotype is the Blackfeet and other tribes were out chasing the bison, right, looking for the bison. And in fact, they created spaces so the bison came to them, right? So they don't have to go chase anything. Um, they can create it. So anyway, so that's sort of a lot of the research that's being done now. Um, mostly in Canada, trying to look at how did people use this vast area. It's so arid, it's so dry, and how did they survive for thousands and thousands of years using this space. And so those are some of the things they're kind of uncovering. So that's kind of the utilitarian idea. So what, what did they think about this, right? <laughs> so very briefly, I'm going to sort of talk a, a little bit about sort of what is um, uh, sometimes I like to use the word religion, sometimes I don't. To now I'll, I'll kind of use it. So I also use belief systems. So what most religious scholars think about belief systems or religious systems is that it kind of boils down to four things. Um, so no matter what culture in the world it kind of has these four elements within their religious systems or their belief systems. One is they have a unique worldview, right? That's how they figure out, that's how they decide the way the universe works, what parts of the universe exist out there. Um, two is how they act upon that. So what kinds of ceremonies and rituals do they create, you know, based on their worldview? Um, the third thing is they, sorry, let me grab some water, um, is that they look at, uh, what kinds of sort of institutions have been created. A lot of, tr a lot of different groups have either churches or some sort of structures or uh, uh, different religious societies that exist. But most, most religious groups somehow create some sort of structure around their belief system. Um, and then the last thing is most um, religious groups also have some sort of ethics or rules, you know, what's right, what's wrong. Um, how should we behave in this society? And it's sort of based on their own kind of worldview, religious belief. And the Blackfeet also have all four of these things as well. Um, tonight, though, I'm really only focusing on the first. I'm just looking at uh, and going to talk about worldview and not really talk about all of the others. So I'm not going to be talking about rituals or ceremonies or the structures that they had, priesthood, because they did have a priesthood system, um, or even really what the ethics or the rules that they had. So, and then just briefly to give you an idea, because for the most part, you know, in, in modern Western society, um, either people are Christian or they have some sort of Christian upbringing. So um, people come with those sort of systems of belief. And so for the most part, the Blackfeet um, are very different and have a very different belief system than Christianity. 
Um, there is no belief in an all-powerful God. Uh, there is not a belief in an all-powerful anything. Uh, there is not a belief that there's anything that's all evil or all good. Um, and in fact, most uh, the belief system is that most beings have both. You know that you're both good and evil, and even if you're a really good person, you're part evil. Um, that uh, there's not the belief in the concept of grace which I hope most of you know what that means because I'm not going to talk about it, or in the concept of sin, right? So those kinds of concepts don't exist at all within um, Blackfeet society. And the other thing is that um, the Blackfeet have a lot of stories, right? That's how they um, uh, know their past, is that there's a lot of different stories. And most of the stories, one, do not have a moral, right? So there's always... When you, whenever you read Native American mythology, people always say, well, where's, what's the moral to that one? And a lot of times there is no moral. It's just most stories are almost always a story of the origin of something, especially for the Blackfeet. Almost every story is an origin story of something. And so what the story is telling is how did that thing come to be and what's the history of it? Uh, almost all of the stories are that, or some sort of like an origin type story even though there's thousands of stories. Um, that's kind of the bottom line, and not really a moral to it. So one of the things that always gets asked is, you know, what is the creation story of the Blackfeet? And there are, let me tell you, multiple creation stories of the Blackfeet. So the Blackfeet, because there's a lot of different groups, um, there are some commonalities and there are some common stories, but for the most part, there are multiple stories of origin and multiple stories of uh, a belief of how the world came to be the way it is. But I'll cut to the chase. <laughs> so one kind of overarching myth is that when the world began, there were two kind of elements. One was the sky world and one was the water world. And the earth did not exist. And there were primordial kind of ever, you know, uh, immortal beings that existed. And one of those beings was a guy or a human, half human, half immortal person named Napi. And in one of the major creation myths, Napi is just kind of hanging out He's always curious, and he's curious as to what else exists besides the sky world and the water world. And so he got, sets out to um, have specific creatures help him look for what else is out there. And so as the story goes, he asks one creature and then another creature and another creature, and he ends up finally um, asking the muskrat to go and kind of discover what else is out there. And the muskrat dives down under the water. Um, and is gone for a really, really long time, and he finally comes back up, and he's got this little paw full of dirt, of mud. And so Noppy takes the mud, and he forms it, he blows on it, and he puts it out to, the, uh, out to the water, and he drops it down, and then out of that grows the earth. And after that happens, then there are multiple, multiple, multiple stories as to how animals came to be, how plants came to be, how mountains came to be, how lakes came to be. So then there's sort of this long series then of other stories of the origin of what happens next. So what comes out of this is sort of the basic belief system that the Blackfeet have. So the Blackfeet worldview is that there are three separate worlds. Um, that they call, and this is their words, they call the above world, which is sort of anything in the sky, the below world, which is earth and anything on the earth, and the water world, uh, anything you know, that lives within the water. And within all of these, and I'm just going to kind of go over briefly kind of the above world um, and the below world, and then um, talk a little bit more about the water world. So within all of these, there are supernatural entities and natural entities. So there are, um, within the sky world, there are people, right? There are people in the sky world. There are animals, there are plants, there are monsters, 
there are supernatural beings, um, there are stars that are actually um, people, there are co uh, constellations that are people. Uh, so anything in the above world is uh, uh, kind of this rich territory that is almost like a parallel existence to what's on Earth and a parallel existence to what's in the water. So you're going to find the same types, although not the exact same people, the like same types of sort of supernatural entities in each place. And all of these have, again, stories about them, uh, histories about them. Uh, and you can find uh, within Blackfeet um, history and stories just about anything about any of these people that exist. And the same with the below world. So on Earth, we have the same sorts of things. We have both supernatural and natural. Uh, we have supernatural entities. We've got uh, uh, plants and animals that are specifically only on Earth. Um, and we have monsters. Uh, the only difference between all of these three worlds is that humans only live on Earth. right? They don't live in the sky world. They don't live in the water world except in rare cases, I should say that. <laughs> never say never. Um, so they, so that those are the kind of separations. So humans are only here. And then really briefly in the water world, it's kind of the same thing. I didn't name too many folks here because I'll go into it a little bit more. But there are, again, um, uh, supernatural entities, natural entities, both in the underwater world as well, and very specific sort of characters and people and monsters. Always monsters. There's monsters everywhere. <laughs> so in the underwater world, so very quickly, uh, the underwater world we know uh, about for lots of different reasons. But one way we know about it is through language. And so one of the reasons why I kind of titled uh, the uh, talk the way it is, which is Suita bees, the, which are the underwater people, is to show you that within the Blackfeet language, uh, there's a designation between what's in the sky world, what's on Earth, and what's in the underwater world. And it's pretty easy to figure out, one, if you know Blackfeet language, but two, even if you don't, because kind of there's a prefix or a suffix in most of the words that designates um, where something comes from. So there are different words for, again, you can see up here, you know, an underwater bison is one word, underwater dog, underwater horse, underwater bear, you know, all of the animals have that, that prefix that's in front of the word. So you don't have to ask when you're hearing a story, is that, which bison is that? Is it a bison that comes from earth? Is it a bison that comes from underwater? Because it's already within the language. And the same with uh, when you're trying to figure out what's natural versus supernatural, there's also a prefix that uh, lets you know what's a natural entity or natural human versus a supernatural. So again, you don't have to sort of make those designations. It's made for you in the language. So over time, what has occurred in Blackfeet history is that there's been uh, relationships that have been formed between all of the different uh, entities that exist underwater with themselves and other entities underwater. Sometimes there's been relationships that have been formed between underwater entities and folks in the sky world. And there's also relationships that have been formed between underwater entities and folks on Earth. And again, there's stories about sort of their origins and their existence and how these relationships have been formed. And one of the reasons why there are a lot of stories about how these relationships occurred is that for the most part, the Blackfeet throughout their history have tried to create um, some sort of relationship with the world around them, mostly through kinship. So they try to um, have a relationship where 
uh, an animal is their relative, or a plant is their relative, or something from the other world is related to them, so that they have that sort of connection to all three worlds. And it's not just sort of humans living alone by themselves, but when they need assistance or they need help, they can call on a relative, um, whether that relative is living in another existence or another realm. So. Oh, I guess the other thing I wanted to add here, they, they also, so, so in the underwater world, one of the things that occurs a lot, actually, in, I shouldn't say it in, in all three realms, this happens, people can change, <laughs> right? Humans can change form, animals can change form, plants can change form, and a lot of times they do that temporarily. Most cases they're doing it temporarily when they're going from one realm to another. Sometimes they change permanently. Um, one of the things I'll tell you about in a little bit is some of the things that change permanently and go from one realm to another realm. But going from world to world uh, is possible, but it's not something that's done um, matter-of-factly. So humans can't jump from one realm to another. Supernaturals can jump from one realm to another, but not humans. And so humans always need assistance. So one of the things that humans have to do uh, is if they want assistance in uh, working with other worlds, whether it's the sky world or whether it's the uh, earth or whether it's the underwater world, is they need to ask for assistance. Uh, so one of the things that they do, the way they do that is uh, what's considered quote unquote prayer, right? And the other is just plain out asking. Unlike uh, the way we think of in Christianity, when you ask for help, you get help. For the most part, in Blackfeet belief systems, when you ask for help, it doesn't mean you're going to get help. <laughs> it's just you hope you're going to get help. So there's sort of a hope is there that you're going to get assistance when you ask for assistance, but it doesn't mean it's actually going to happen. So one of the things that's unique about the Earth is that, and unique in Blackfeet belief systems, is that anything that the Blackfeet use and that is important to them almost always came from another world. It almost always came from the sky world or it came from the water world. Sometimes it came from Earth. Um, but it almost always starts out as a supernatural that then gets transformed into the natural world that now humans can use and humans can benefit from. And so there are a lot of different origin stories that talk about how specific, again, um, different species of animals, plants, uh, useful objects, um, sometimes humans, uh, come from another realm and come to Earth so that now they're useful. A lot of those things actually came from the water world. And so three that I was going to mention tonight are the bison. Uh, the bison have been around for thousands and thousands of years before humans um, existed on the northern Great Plains. Tobacco, which tobacco, uh, most archaeologists uh, claim that tobacco has been on the northern Great Plains for about, they think, the last 5,000 years. And tobacco, as you know, is, is, is indigenous to North America, uh, came originally from South America, um, is one pocket of where tobacco is from. There's another pocket of where um, California is now, where um, tobacco came uh, native, is native to that region. The tobacco that is, was used by the Blackfeet, um, archaeologists believe, originally came from what is now California, and that it moved up the coast, and then it moved over the Rocky Mountains, somewhere up way, way north of what is now Canada, Alberta, Canada, and then moved its way back down. And they think that happened again between 5,000 and 6,000 years ago. 6,000 was kind of over here, 5,000 was kind of over here, moved its way down. But tobacco is a domesticated species um, that can only be um, cultivated and farmed. So it doesn't, there is one species that grows wild, but the Blackfeet never used the wild species. They only used um, the domesticated species. And then um, the third thing was horses. And it's kind of interesting um, that the story around horses is very similar to the story around bison. 
because horses, as you know, um, are from North America, and they were here before humans were here. But depending on when you think humans were here, they might have been here the same time humans were here. And then they left, and then they came back with the Spanish, uh, in the, at least on the Northern Great Plains around 1700. So. So the story of how bison came to be. So in the Blackfeet uh, history, bison are an underwater animal. And they always were an underwater animal. And when you look at, again, sort of the origin stories of the Blackfeet, one of the uh, storylines is that the Blackfeet were vegetarians. So they started out as vegetarians, and they only ate roots, and they ate berries. Uh, they also ate a lot of mineral deposits, clay, and different things that came from the earth. And they never ate meat, partly because, as the story goes, it wasn't really there for their taking. And so they lived for years and years as vegetarians. And one day, a young man, this is as the story goes, they, 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 there are a lot of commonalities in Blackfeet stories. There's always a young man, there's a young woman, orphan child <laughs> that shows up on the scene. So in this particular story, a young man uh, comes into a community and befriends a family, and he's interested in marrying their daughter, of course. And so the father goes, he talks to the father, I'm interested in marrying your daughter, and the, as I told you earlier, then the father goes to the daughter and says, oh, are you interested in marrying this guy? And so she says yes, so they get married. And as time goes on, they're realizing that um, even though they're vegetarians, they're realizing that the guy that just married into their family is not really a vegetarian, and they're a little perturbed by the fact that he's eating something different than they are. And so as the story goes, th these are very, very long stories. I'm kind of shrinking them down. <laughs> as the story goes on, the father finds out that he uh, is different than they are. And so he tries to uncover exactly how is this person different than they are. And um, so he, t he has them on, sends them on these tests, right? And he's testing him and he's testing him to try and figure out what's different about this person. So what he finds out is that this person eats meat, right? And he doesn't eat roots and berries like they do. He eats meat. So then he's trying to find out, okay, wait, where do you, where do you get that? Like, where is that from? What is that? And so in the process, while, this, while they're doing this testing, the young man finally says, well, you know, I'm kind of tired of this family, and he takes off. So the uh, daughter gets left behind. And of course, you know, as all these stories are, she's pregnant. You know, <laughs> and she has, now has to uh, take care of a child. And it turns out when the child is born, it turns into a baby bison. So then the family goes, oh, wait, now we know. That guy was different. Uh, so they, so instead of taking care of the child, they kind of look at it and go, okay, that child's different. We're not going to take care of it. So they leave it and they take off. So they leave this little baby bison. Baby bison's living by itself and he's out there in the elements. And um, while he's living out alone, two young men come by and find him. And he, because He's a supernatural, changes back into being a human, because he is half human, turns into a human. The two young men befriend him, and then they take off, and they have all these adventures, right? And they're hanging out together and having all these adventures. And then finally, the, uh, the baby bison's kind of grown up, and he's a little bit older. And he tells the two young guys, hey, you know, why don't I'll take you to go meet my family. So they go to the lake, and there's this huge lake. They show up, and the young men are saying, wait, what are you talking about? Where's your family at? And as they're, as they're saying this, coming out of the water are a family of bison that now comes and, and, and visits with the two human people. And they invite him down into the lake. And the two humans are like, well, how do we do that? And they're like, yeah, just watch us. You know? And so they follow them down into the lake. They go into their house. They have a lodge. They live down there. Go down there, spend time. They get to visit. And the grandfather, Bison, 
um, is so thankful, and as the story goes, you know, the grandfather bison is so thankful that he, his, his young grandson has been raised and has been taken care of, that he decides to basically sacrifice part of the bison herd to those young men and to their village um, for helping take care of this, this young bison child. So again, it's kind of a long story because they stay down there for a while and lots of different stuff happens and they end up back on earth and the bison leader um, sacrifices again some of his own people, chases them out of the underwater world and they become earth bison. And at that point, they can't turn around and come back. So again, it's a longer story, because now the humans have no idea what to do with these things, because they've never hunted, they've never killed anything, and they don't eat meat. So part of the story then is now they have to send, the underwater bison have to send an emissary, right, to come and teach the humans how to actually hunt, butcher, you know, kill, and, and cook the meat. So anyway, that's sort of the end of the story, this sort of long story to bring. Um, but it's a very similar story to, I'm just going to jump forward here, to horses. So it's kind of interesting that uh, with that one story, people can trace it back a, a very, very long time, partly because of the way the elements within the story um, so sometimes scholars can try and figure out, right, how old an actual oral history is or how old a story is. The story of the bison is a very, very old story. Um, but some of the same elements are in the story with the horse. So even though the horse, we know, right, because it was really introduced in about 18, or 1720s, uh, maybe 1730s, there's an actual date you can kind of put on when horses show up in Blackfeet country. But the Blackfeet kind of redeveloped a new story about where the horse came from. And it's very, very similar to the bison story. Uh, so it's, a, it's almost the same story in the sense of there's a young man, goes out, um, befriends uh, somebody that turns out to be from the horse family that lives underwater. And he gets invited down, he goes underwater, um, and the same sort of thing happens where he then, uh, the horse people who live underwater befriend him and um, give him the gift of horses. And so when he leaves, he takes with them part of the horse herd, not all of them, um, part of the horse herd, and he takes them back to the Blackfeet, and then they start using horses. And those two stories are... Um, Similar in that sense, and there's still a similar belief uh, when these were first uh, told and recorded, and then of course when I heard them later, much later in life, um, that the Blackfeet still believe there still are bison that live underwater, and there still are horses that live underwater, and there are still very specific places on the landscape where these stories happened, and that um, there are, uh, within these underwater worlds, like connections between places. There are stories about, for example, there are lakes along the Rocky Mountain front where there are stories of both um, animals and people who travel underneath the lake from, say, Flathead Lake to underneath the Rockies to the lakes on the other side um, because that's sort of the way people travel. And the story with, um, backing up, the story with Tobacco is a little bit of a different story, um, but it's also an under, underwater story. Tobacco is a plant, again, that's a domesticated species, that um, the Blackfeet got from beavers. And although we today consider beavers kind of a mammal and, a, and a, what we probably consider an earth animal, the Blackfeet consider beavers an underwater animal. And the beavers are the ones that introduced the Blackfeet to tobacco, taught them how to use it, taught them how to farm, taught them how to cultivate it, um, and uh, gave it to uh, the Blackfeet one winter. And um, ever since then, the Blackfeet started cultivating tobacco on earth. So that, again, there's still tobacco that is considered underwater tobacco, and there's tobacco now that's considered part of the earth realm. 
And um, it's something that then, in addition to the beavers teaching them how to actually farm and use it, they also taught them a lot of um, ritual that went along with that. So in terms of the Blackfeet having this different view about water and earth and sky, um, you always see these same types of stories and these same types of um, history about how the world kind of relates to each other and interacts with each other. And there's also specific places where a lot of these stories occur. So they can go back and say, this is the place where you know, we found out about tobacco and where tobacco was given to us from the beavers and that now we cultivate it and use it. And for the most part, the Blackfeet actually grew tobacco until maybe the mid-1800s when trade tobacco was introduced. And trade tobacco has a much higher um, nicotine content, much, much higher nicotine content. And so people started using that instead of the grown tobacco that they had always used. So I was going to open it up for questions to ask people if they have any questions about this. Uh, but that's sort of a basic bare bones view of the Blackfeet worldview and universe and kind of the way they think the thing, everything works. Thank so, you. Thanks. about the ark. Oh. Can you tell us something about that? It's wonderful. <laughs> so I wanted to try and find something um, otherworldly <laughs> for the art. Most of the art, and it, I think almost all of this art is from a guy named Norval Morisot, and he's a Canadian Ojibwe artist. And he specifically um, does his artwork so that it reflects because the Ojibwe have very similar views to the Blackfeet in terms of multiple worlds. And he um, tries to draw things where he is um, looking at other worlds. So uh, they kind of have the same belief in an underwater world and a sky world and a, um, so anyway. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's Nor Norval, am I saying that name right, Dave? Norval Moriso. Well, beyond being wonderful and really goes well with your talk. I really had exactly the same question. I was wondering about the art. It's so wonderful. And I guess I had one other um, connected question. Are there traditions of telling these stories through art as through verbal stories? Or is this a recent, um, this one man's um, efforts to represent visually things that have been told? Uh, for the Ojibwe, them, so for the, Ojib for the Ojibwe, yes, there's been a tradition where they drew this type of artwork. And, um, and they used to draw, at least for the Ojibwe, they drew it on birch bark. So they found, a, and they would do like scrolls, you know, and they used to, do, they used to have this kind of, you know, um, artwork where they were showing kind of the spirit world and then human world. And so they had a lot of artwork where they kind of had this dual um, representation. Uh, the Blackfeet did not have that for the most part. Um, there, there are places where the Blackfeet did a lot of um, what we'd consider like rock art, right? And they did in that, in, in those places, they did have artwork where they um, drew a lot of things where they were showing sort of the spirit world and supernatural world. Um, but not the same way as the Ojibwe. This is a very, very unique art form. So. Um, I've, I've heard about those tobacco patches, but I was never sure of the exact plant. Do you know what plant that was? I could write it down for you. Um, yeah, I do. <laughs> no, it's a very specific species of, of um, tobacco plant. And it's different than uh, what we consider commercial tobacco now. 
commercial tobacco, you guys have probably seen commercial tobacco. It's like really, really big, probably about six feet tall. The leaves are this giant, and you know, you make cigars out of them and everything. Um, the kind of tobacco that the Blackfeet grew is the same tobacco that the crow grow, and it's not very tall at all. Uh, it only grows maybe about three feet, and the leaves, instead of being like this, the leaves are these long, skinny leaves like that, and it's very, it's different. It's the same plant, but it's just, it's a different type of plant. So. I just was curious about what kind of things you will ask for help for. In other words, do you ask the water world for some particular things and the sky world for something else, or is it sort of neutral? It's, so in the old days, what people used to ask for is sort of the common stuff, right? They'd ask to um, be better hunters. They'd ask to um, have... Uh, have more stuff. <laughs> They'd ask to be more wealthy. Uh, they would ask to have um, more capabilities. So if that meant being stronger. Um, and they would also do this for their animals as well. So for example, um, once they had horses and they were using horses, if they wanted their horse to, you know, be able to run for three days straight without stopping. Um, they would ask for assistance to do that. Uh, so it was usually some towards, towards that end. Uh, they didn't always get assistance, like I said, but a lot of times they did. So for example, there's, you know, I mean, there's a lot of stories about in, uh, in terms of the water realm where you know, a hunter would ask for assistance that they would be a, a better hunter and they would carry water with them and almost like, for those Catholics out there, um, almost like holy water, they would, they would carry it with them and they'd sprinkle it on whatever they needed to be transformative and it would be. So for example, if they were wanted to improve their hunting skill, if they asked for assistance and they got it, what they would do is they would cover their, um, their arrowhead with water um, that the powerful water, and then it would make them uh, more successful in hunting. Uh, or they would do the same for themselves if they were doing something transformative themselves. For example, um, if they wanted to, back in the old days before they had horses, they were on foot all the time, right? So they, had, they ran a lot. So there's a lot of stories about how to increase your running stamina and how to run longer you know, say you're running away from the enemy and you want to run for four days straight, you ask for assistance, and one of the things they would do is they'd take water and they'd put it in their hair, and then it would make them run faster. Powerful water, right? Um, so it's that kind of thing that they would be asking assistance for. So sort of the common, the common stuff, anybody would ask for assistance. Hello. Um, along that similar vein, was there any distinction between like surface water or groundwater, or did they make distinctions like that, or was there any power distribution in that regard? I knew someone would ask that question. So a little bit. Okay. So the sky world had control over the creation of rain and snow. So the sky world can, could, could control how much um, rain there was, and they could stop it from raining. And the sky world could, if it wanted to, because it, the sun is in the sky world, could um, dry up all the surface water. And there are several stories where a human asked for assistance. A human got upset with other humans, went to the sky world, ask the sun to dry up all the water, surface water, and, and, the, and the sun said, okay, and did it, right? Um, in that particular story, the dogs went out and they were, start, they were, they were suffering as well from you know, kind of heat exposure uh, and not having enough water. 
So the dogs went back to the sun and said, hey, you know, it's okay if you mess with those humans, but what about us? You know, you got to give us some water. And then the sun goes, oh, oh yeah, okay. And then kind of reversed order and gave them water all over again. Um, so yeah, so there's kind of a, um, but in terms of rain, that's something that's completely controlled by the sky world and, um, and snow. So like yesterday, if it's snowing too much, <laughs> you could ask, in that case, you'd have to go to the sky world. You can't go to the water world. You go to the sky world and you'd ask, can you please make it stop snowing? I'm kind of like, <laughs> and, and, and if assistance was given, the snow would stop. And there were certain people who were known, certain humans to have, to, known to have um, those types of powers where they had a very strong connection with the supernatural world where they could control weather at whim, at their own whim. Um, but that was something that the sky world did and not the water world. The water world, <coughs> I think I had it on my, sorry, <coughs> I think I had it on my list. Um, one of the major uh, natural phenomena that comes from the water world is the wind. So the Blackfeet, I'm sorry, <coughs> the Blackfeet believe that wind comes from underwater. So it's not an earth phenomena, it's an underwater phenomena that comes out from under the water and then blows across the land. So if it were too windy <laughs> and you wanted to stop the wind, then you'd have to go to the water world and ask assistance to stop the wind from blowing. But for those of us who are from the other side of the mountains, <laughs> it doesn't happen that much. <laughs> I just wondered if you ran across in your research about the Blackfeet building boats or using boats to cross large bodies of water. Not large bodies of water. They made, they made rafts and they made kind of like the Mandan Hadatsa. Sometimes they made those kind of buffalo um, kind of uh, bull boats. But usually all they're doing, you know, I mean, they're not going across lakes because this is the northern Great Plains. I mean, the biggest thing they're going across is maybe the Missouri River because there's just no, there's no water for really them to. And even, you know, I mean, the biggest, you know, that one big lake that's up in Canada, the Pococke Lake, that's like this deep. You know, it's big, but it's not very deep, so. I recall that you said um, the stories were seldom, if ever, used to teach morals or rules or things of that sort. And I thought that was kind of interesting because, like, the Aborigines have a lot of stories about treating water with proper respect because there was so little of it and, and there was a, a water serpent that lived in the water and if you messed with the water he'd come and get you and so on. And so I, I was surprised not to hear any of that kind of story in such a, you know, a people that lived in a dry place and I wondered if the cosmology says there was all this water before there was earth. Does that mean these people came from a place where there used to be a lot more water? So two things. One, there are some stories that have a moral. And most of those stories have to do with a supernatural named Napi. And most of those stories aren't that there's a moral, but an, kind of an anti-moral, right? So you know, it, almost all Napi stories are um, he goes and does something, and it always gets messed up, and he always makes mistakes, and he's kind of always the fool. And, um, and so the moral of that story is you don't do what he just did. So it's kind of the anti-moral, right? And so there are a lot, a lot, a lot of Napi stories that kind of teach those kinds of lessons of how you deal with nature. There's a lot of stories about how you deal with nature, how you treat nature, how you treat other animals, how you treat plants, um, how you treat kind of the world around you, how you treat other humans. Um, but those stories are all kind of told in the Right, the opposite of how you, how you should not treat somebody versus how you should treat them. Um, and then the other part of your question, I'm sorry, what first was? It's about, it sounds, sounds like uh, the Black Sea came from a place where there used to be a lot of water because they believed that there was lots of water in the 
Right. So, okay, so there's also, um, there's kind of a mythological, right, worldview stories of how the universe came to be the universe that we live in. And then there's also kind of what you'd consider kind of historic stories of where the Blackfeet actually came from. And there are two main stories, and I think both of them are true, personally. So one story is that the Blackfeet came from the south and that they were in an area that suffered a major, major drought. And they had to find a new place to live. And so they sent out individual people looking for a new place to live, and they went in different directions. And in that particular story, they sent people up north and then over the mountains, and they found a new place to live. I think that it could be a true story that some people who are now the Blackfeet may have come from the southwest, may have suffered a drought, a severe enough drought that they had to leave and relocate someplace else. There's also another story that is probably true as well, where the Blackfeet came from the north and they went south. And in that particular story, um, they cross a very, very large lake that's frozen and they walk across it, walk across it, walk across it and finally get to the other half and um, at some point part of the lake breaks apart and so some of the people get left behind and the rest go forward um, across kind of this frozen landscape. And I think both of those could be potentially true, like the true story of where the Blackfeet came from, um, sort of, and then uh, merging. Because, you know, we don't know how, I mean, people, people came and went and formed new groups and, you know, dismantled and migrated around North America before they came to be where they are. So. Rosalind, may I ask you a question? Sure. And I don't know exactly how to ask it, but we're in the midst of this series about water in the West. And I'm wondering how the traditional beliefs and the worldview of the Blackfeet um, funnel into the whole discussion that we're, not, that we're now having with non-tribal people and Blackfeet and who uses the water and who controls the water and who owns the water or anything like that. I mean, when Blackfeet people talk about this or think about these issues that we're dealing with, do these, does this worldview filter into their thoughts about it or, or are they kind of beyond that? Are these traditional stories that aren't so, do you see what I mean? I, I hope so, but. <laughs> well, this, this is modern America and modern Montana. So the majority of people doing the discussion around water issues are lawyers. <laughs> so they, uh, they don't believe in anything. So worldview does not get factored in. No, I, no I, the, the majority of people doing that stuff are, are attorneys. And so, um, so, there, so there are some people who still um, think of this as part of Blackfeet worldview. I, it's fewer and fewer people. Uh, for the most part, in the last 100 plus years, um, many Blackfeet have converted to Christianity. Um, most have converted to Catholicism. Um, another large portion have converted to um, what you'd consider fundamental Christianity. And so there are, I mean, there are some similarities, I, I shouldn't say some, there's a lot of similarities to a certain extent in terms of um, worldview that mesh pretty well between um, especially Catholicism and, and Blackfeet ideas about the way the world works. Um, except, again, the Blackfeet don't really have a really um, kind of all-powerful God or good, you know, like everybody's good, everybody's evil, um, heaven, hell, those kinds of things don't exist in Blackfeet worldview, so. Is, is there any possibility that the Blackfeet tradition about the use of powerful water would have had a reverse influence and affected how the Catholic community uses powerful water? For example, blessing and the things you described. I'll let Anne answer that question. No. <laughs> I think that um, the Catholic Church is very good, 
has been very good and continues to be very good about incorporating uh, indigenous belief systems into their own belief systems. And so uh, with the Blackfeet, when the Catholics um, came onto the Blackfeet reservation, they were able to figure out some of those key kind of cultural elements that the Blackfeet viewed as important and they were able to incorporate them um, into uh, uh, creating kind of a blended, but it's still Catholic um, uh, belief system. So they are able to use um, sort of the idea of water, the idea of um, the sun and the moon. Um, they were able to, to also blend in the use of tobacco and incense in prayer. Um, there's a lot of things that they were able to blend together. So.